to Maine, Rhode Island, Staten Island, New York, Louisiana, Florida, and more in the pages of Rising, our chosen book. We have also been to the San Francisco Bay Estuary and the Ghost Forests of North Carolina with our guest wetland ecologist the other week. And everywhere we go, we are tabulating the cost of rising seas and how people are affected by them. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you've lived through some of the recent hurricanes or catastrophic flash flooding events in Tennessee, Alabama, and the Northeast this fall, or flooding inland. Or maybe you're living through the West's fire season right now with bad air quality or the distant potential of an evacuation order. Um, or maybe uh, some other symptom of climate change is touching your life and that of your community, summer heat, chronic drought, disrupted crop growing cycles, ecological disturbances, you name it. One of the reasons we picked this book to share with Science Friday listeners this fall, well before this fall's disasters, was the way in which climate change seems to finally be on the national political and emotional radar as well. We may even have some federal legislation that will make a difference, Democrats in the House willing, uh, but at the end of the day, seas have still been rising and will continue to rise at least some amount. Communities along the coast will have to make choices about infrastructure adaptation and whether to stay or go. So we're gonna talk about some of what I like to call the squishy stuff. What makes climate change so complicated for the people living it and how maybe conversation, how maybe that conversation can sound different. And we want to take as many of your questions as we can. So listen to the conversation, get those uh, questions ready uh, and raise your hand, so to speak, when the time comes. Um, but first, please clap your hands for Elizabeth Rush, uh, silently through your internet connections, author of Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore. She's a professor of the practice in the English department at Brown University and affiliated with their Institute for Environment and the Society in Providence. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you and everyone who's joined us this evening. Yeah, I've been talking to you a lot in the last couple of months, or it feels like a lot, and I'm really excited to share you with our readers now. Um, Diana, I'm so sorry. Can you share the results of that poll that we put up? I did not get a chance to look at it. I was too busy reading that very long script. Yeah, no problem. Let me share it just in a second. Okay. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. And I do want to clarify, if you're not reading Rising right now, that's okay. We don't even like feel upset if you don't go out and buy or read it later, but I think it's a good book and I hope you do. Um, but it does look that like a good half of our audience is currently reading Rising, another 25% have finished reading the book. Um, a couple people still haven't gotten their book, which makes sense. Supply chain is kind of weird right now. Um, and a few people haven't read it um, and may not be planning to. And again, that's okay. We've got a lot to talk about um, that you don't have to have read. There's no quiz. <laughs> so Elizabeth, Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think my first question for you actually is that this week in our, we have a discussion question that we send out to everyone every week. And this week we've been asking people to reflect on vulnerability and sort of proportionate vulnerability. So how sea level rise may be affecting people who might already have more vulnerability in their life as it is. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the ways in which maybe that that kind of vulnerability showed up for you as you were writing Rising? It's interesting. I feel like when I started writing about sea level rise in general, um, you know, I chose that topic because I felt like this was a place where we could start to see climate change's impacts in the present tense. And I went into into researching in that area, expecting to spend a lot of time in sort of coastal communities with wealthy second homeowners and folks who I think stereotypically we might imagine have the funds to like live alongside the ocean. And I pretty quickly realized that the places that were being impacted the most devastatingly in the present tense were communities that were sited sort of alongside of or on top of wetlands. And those communities tended to be lower income. They tended to be communities of color. Um, they tended to be indigenous communities. And these, I think, you know, what I started to recognize was that their vulnerability wasn't arrived at by chance. It was arrived at because of sort of a larger set of social and historical structures that meant that living on top of already flood prone land was sort of one of the only option they had. So I saw, you know, uh, 
communities that were founded by runaway slaves seeking out wetlands as um, spaces of invisibility or spaces that offered a kind of security because they existed beyond the fringes of normal society. I saw a lot of um, just in general working class communities, places where in dense metropolitan areas, you had folks seeking out um, some version of the American dream by purchasing a, a freestanding home and the place they could afford to do that was on land that literally a hundred years ago wasn't, wasn't considered fit for human use. And so that became actually like a really defining lens that I carried around with me as I got deeper into this project. I not only wanted to look at sort of what places were being impacted now in the present tense by climate change, but I also wanted to think about where are the communities that are vulnerable before the storm even arrives. And that also, I think, kind of blossoms into this question of whether or not we might be able to begin to approach climate change as an opportunity multiplier and a threat multiplier. Like, how do you think about maybe moving folks away from risk or away from vulnerability as part of our response to climate change? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the communities, and you and I had a conversation about the, for example, the buyout in Staten Island after Hurricane Sandy, where the community got together and asked for help doing so um, and successfully did so. But we didn't get to talk about Ile de Jean Charles, which is sort of a different, it's a different place. Uh, it, it is a place where people are in the process of moving away from danger in some ways, but, but it's a different kind of story and maybe one that is shaped more by vulnerability in some ways. And I, I would love for you to maybe expand more on that. Sure. So, I mean, I think the Staten Island story is a story of like a white, predominantly white, but some immigrants um, and some immigrants are also white. So that's like not necessarily the most useful qualifier either, but um, a, a working class community in Staten Island coming together and asking to be moved. The Isle de Jean Charles is a bit more complicated because the folks who live out there are largely Biloxi, Chittimacha, Choctaw. Um, and they ended up in, in this place in part because uh, these various tribal communities were fleeing colonial violence. And so they all kind of convened in this space that's really on the fringes of uh, Southern Louisiana. And in part because of that, uh, mixing of different native communities there, they don't have federal recognition as a uh, tribe. So that land isn't technically tribal land, which means that they have a much harder time making this claim that they by legally are, are sort of owed land somewhere else as the land where they've made their lives is disappearing. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about that land disappearing, you know, it has the island as they call it, you know, has shrunk so considerably over the last 50 years that it really is just like a little spine of what it once was um, when folks came to live there in the first place. So some folks on the island have been organizing for well over a decade to ask that the state and federal government help in relocation. Other folks on the island are really not interested in relocation. And in the, you know, towards the end of the Obama era, um, the chief, Chief Albert, was able to sort of petition for and win this big resiliency grant to get funds to relocate um, the Isle, to make a new Isle de Jean Charles inland. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens after that is that the story gets kind of confusing because the question becomes, well, who are we gonna build new homes for? Is it only people who remain on the island now in the present tense? Is it people who 
left in the last 10 years? Is it people who left in the last 20 years? Is it people who left in the last 30 years? Like we've seen land loss in this area for decades and it's certainly sea level rise exacerbated, but it's also caused by lots of other different things, um, including sort of erosion due to the oil and gas industry. So mm -hmm. it becomes this long convolute, more convoluted, more complicated story. And the idea is that uh, everyone can move in together as a group, right? And this is, I think, in some ways, a beautiful ideal. And at the same time, what do you do with the people who don't want to move? Like, mm -hmm. do they get counted out? Um, are they sort of then moving out of the tribal community? Is is there another option? Could you say, oh, well, you don't have to go to the land that the state is giving us inland. You could go somewhere else. And I feel like the longer I spent with that community, the more I started to recognize that those people who kind of have the most options going into the storm or going into the event that's going to maybe unlock the coffers, the federal coffers for any kind of aid, mm -hmm. often have the most opportunity going out. And the, the ones with the most going in have more opportunity going out. The ones with sort of the least amount of resources going into the storm have the least amount of resources coming out. So this indigenous community, I think, has some autonomy and some power over the decision-making processes that sort of dictate their relocation, but certainly not as much as what we see on, the, on Staten Island by comparison. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, as we saw in Staten Island, the people who got the buyout, actually most of them stayed on Staten Island. Um, we have a question actually from Mariah, I, I want to say in Boston. Yeah, go ahead, Mariah. Hi, thanks for the book. I'm so enjoying it. It's an amazing book, wonderful storytelling. And um, I just, you know, when I was reading the part about the um, community in Isle de, Isle de Jean Charles, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Um, there's a lot of people that don't want to leave because it's the only home that they've ever known. And I wondered, how does this impact climate action to help these areas recover? Could you say that the last sentence of your question again, you wonder how this impacts what? The, the sort of climate action needed to help these wetlands recover? Well, my brain goes to kind of a couple different places at once with that question. The first is, first and foremost, I think I went into writing this book thinking like when you flood for the third time or when you flood for the fourth time, you leave. Like that's a rational decision that someone makes. And the more time I spent in these low lying, but also incredibly beautiful and incredibly sort of unifying places in part around people become unified around that sense of community and the specialness of the, these locations. The longer I spent in these communities, the more I recognized that everybody has a very personal set of questions that they have to answer in response to do I want to stay and do I want to go and if I'm going to stay you know how can I hold on to this place that I love that's defined me even as it's changing fundamentally and if I go how can I not let go of the community that rose up out of that very special place and so you know I think it's sort of a question around like staying against great odds as the actual character of a place changes really radically or going and holding on to community even when you aren't geographically proximate anymore. And if we're talking about helping folks stay in place, then there are certainly design solutions that can buy us some time Southern Louisiana is right now, you know, attempting to move silt um, from different places within the Mississippi River watershed and redistribute it into the low-lying wetlands communities at the Mississippi River's mouth to essentially help the land rebuild um, and buy some time. That's a design solution that might help us get, you know, 20, 30 years 
But given that we know that sea level rise continues to accelerate, it's not going to, you know, permanently change the dynamics of this equation that we have extremely low lying land and sea levels that are rising at a rate that's just unprecedented in human history. Um, when we think about how to answer that question in terms of people leaving, you know, I think it's interesting to look at the New York example where the city said, we want to help people stay nearby in part because we don't want to lose their property taxes. <laughs> so we're going to give them a 5% bonus on closing um, when they sell their land back to the, when they sell their land in their home to the state so that if they choose to stay in the five boroughs, they'll get that extra 5% so that they can afford to maybe stay nearby. And in the case of Staten Island, that worked like 80% of people stayed on the island. And so a lot of those folks maintain their community. They maintain you know, the same butchers and grocery stores and they hang out with the same people on the weekends. What's changed fundamentally is their exposure to flooding. But when I, when I think about that example and I try to use, think about applying it in the context of Louisiana, I immediately have more difficulty imagining how that works just because mm -hmm. there's not as much land that's above sort of that future high tide line that's close to the Isle de Jean Charles. It's all really low lying around there. So when you think about moving people away from risk, you're now suddenly talking about helping people move 30, 40 miles inland as opposed to maybe half a mile, a mile up the hill. Um, great question. So I neglected to ask you to read an excerpt earlier, but I think this would be a great time for it while we're still talking about Isle de Jean Charles. Or, and I, I, I must be pronouncing it wrong because I'm going full French on it. Uh, is the way you've been saying it the way everyone who lives there says it? Um, I've heard it both. So yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm not picky, but <laughs> I'm sure someone out there is picky. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would love to read this section. It comes kind of early in the book. And what you need to know is that I'm on the island and I'm talking to a guy named Chris whose family is from the island. He spent his entire life on the island. Um, and he's just trying to keep track of how fundamentally this place has changed and what he can hold on to in the present tense. Eventually, Chris arrives at the photo he wants to show me. In it, his father is tilling the ground in a dirty white button-up shirt flanked by okra plants. That was all the way back in 1959, Chris says, the year he married my mother. His father is working the land his parents had given him as a wedding gift. Chris runs his finger over the image and hands it to me. It looked so different back then. I've been in the Terrebonne Parish for over a week and everywhere I go, people keep telling me how it used to be. They even have photographic evidence. It's almost as if the Islanders lived on a different island, a near perfect copy of the Jean Charles of today, but ruled by a slightly different set of laws. Everything here is just as it was there with a few notable exceptions. The cypress are all in the same places, but their leaves have vanished. Some of the land where gardens once sat remains, but salt rests in the soil. The plants won't grow and the land lies fallow. And what was once a wetland rich and foul is now open water. In the photo Chris shows me, his father stands surrounded by pastures. You can even make out a black cow in the upper right corner. In the 60 years since, the meadows where the cattle used to graze have all slipped beneath the surface of the sea. When I was a boy, Dalton says, my papa used to go out into the marshes just south of the house. He'd be gone all day and would return with a sack full of dead ducks. He gave them to people. That's how many ducks he had. My pa was a good hunter, but back then there was enough to hunt, enough to go around. Today, if you were to open up Chris's refrigerator, you wouldn't find ducks, fish, beef, or homegrown vegetables. Instead, you'd probably discover two gallons of industrial milk, three two-liter bottles of no-name soda pop, and a box of frosted flakes. Right out there, 
That's where the marshes were, says Chris, pointing south through his painless window. I look out and see only water. The wind whips up a couple white caps and the sun glitters hard atop each one. It used to be that you could walk all the way to Montague without getting your feet wet. Now you can see clear across to the water tower, but you have to take a boat to get there. Since the ducks that his father used to hunt no longer nest nearby, Dalton drives to Homa to purchase Purdue saline soaked poultry. Both he and Chris still eat local shrimp, but they supplement that with government subsidized grains and vegetables grown by agricultural giants. Sometimes we have these unplanned reunions at Walmart, says Chris. I mean, you run into a lot of people who used to live on the island, and even those of us that remain. We're all there buying food, catching up. It's nice to see the people I miss. Chris's statement is so matter of fact, so tinged with nostalgia that I nearly miss its implications. The actions he is describing are not harmless or merely circumstantial. They're a feedback loop, if a relatively slight one. The disappearance of coastal land is causing human beings who are once self-sufficient, whose impact on the planet was slight, to use fossil fuels to procure the food they once were able to grow at home. Every time the islanders drive to Homa, they are, in some small way, accelerating the disappearance of this ecosystem. I want to ask if they know the consequences of their new way of life, but I can't think of a way to formulate this question without sounding rude. Instead, I ask for another slice of cake. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think that's such a good paragraph to paragraph, a good reading to just about the ways in which climate change is about more than just where you live and the land you occupy, but it's about your food and it's about how connected you are to people you care about. Um, and it's affecting so much about the way people live besides just like in a storm, um, they lose land. And we have a question actually from Vera. I think one more before we leave uh, the island. Uh, Vera, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, just if you know how uh, the Isle de Jean Charles uh, was affected during Hurricane Ida. That's a great question. Um, the island was really tremendously impacted by Ida. I was able to catch up with Chris a couple weeks ago, and. Um, depending on where you've gotten into the, in the book, if you're reading the book, you may know that he's in a wheelchair um, and he has like a pretty rudimentary like bucket elevator that helps him get from the floor up to it, from the ground floor up to his house because his house sits on um, stilts that are about 20 feet high. And a big chunk of his roof caved in during the storm and the elevators broken and that kind of damage you he reported seeing sort of all over the island he's actually currently living in Homa um and he's in a pretty tricky bind because the home that he's supposed to move into as part of relocation is under construction and so he's trying to essentially apply for FEMA funding to get money to help repair his home on the island so that he can move back into it for a couple months until um, until the home that he will eventually relocate to in Chauvin is ready. Um, and a lot of folks on the island are sort of in the same bind that he's in. And, and it's unclear if funding is gonna be made available for him to get back into his home. Um, so I typically give like a lot of my speaking fees, a, a percentage of my speaking fees to this really amazing group called Anthropocene Alliance that helps connect frontline communities to resources like pro bono um, legal help and pro bono hydrological assessment so that they can both identify their risk and then make a plan for how they want to address it moving forward. And lately this fall, I've just been sending money to Chris on the island, Chris on the island so that he can distribute it to folks who need it just for short-term stuff like food and, and 
um, maybe tarping or things that might help them in a short-term way move back into their homes. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth, behind the scenes radio request, can you uh, move your hair off of the microphone that is uh, yes. connected to your computer? Thank you. Is that better? Yes, that's that's great. There's <laughs> always like that little, there's a little whispery noise that happens with that. And it's never a big deal until you're like recording for a radio segment. Uh, so everyone, you got to see behind the scenes of being a producer for this show. I'm just listening to hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to task you with having to like clean that sound up. I'm sure it's awful. <laughs> I, I think we may have a filter solution for it. If like we can automate it to a certain amount, but to a certain extent, but some of it's just there. Um, anyway, questions. Um, I mean, do you think storms like Ida are changing the conversation around either retreat or um, how frontline communities are left vulnerable and what options they have? It's interesting. I think I was fundamentally like flabbergasted and disappointed by media coverage of Ida. It, it in my world sort of was here for like three days and then gone. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that it didn't produce the kind of, I hate to use this word, but like disaster pornography that helps keep storms in the news media limelight. Um, we know that the levees held in and around New Orleans, though they certainly didn't hold in other places. And there was incredible flooding that happened as a result of Ida. But I think we kind of overlooked that to celebrate quickly the infrastructure success of like keeping New Orleans head above water for this one moment in time. Mm -hmm. And it was also recorded as like the fifth highest, fifth strongest um, winds to be recorded in, in mainland United States. And we, I think have grown really accustomed to storms being record-breaking. And mm -hmm. so, if it's not a record breaking storm, I don't think that we hear about it in the same way. And that just makes my stomach turn. It's like, oh, we're already growing sort of immune to the intensity of these events because we expect everyone to be, every like successive one to be stronger than the last. I don't think that's the way we would have spoken. I think Ida would have been around a lot longer in news media coverage had it made landfall 15 years ago um, mm -hmm. because there was incredible um, flooding that happened with it, incredible amounts of impacts in all different kinds of frontline communities. Mm -hmm. I, but I also simultaneously think that our public conversation around managed retreat as a sea level rise adaptation strategy has started to shift. I do think we're seeing more of it. Um, and I find that very bolstering because I think in many ways, we, we have been doing managed retreat in this country, a lot, largely around riverine ecosystems for the past 30 years, but the number of people that we've helped move away from risk is so minimal and inconsequential when we try to map it, like is so minimal inconsequential in comparison to the amount of people that we will have to help move away from risk in the decades mm -hmm. to come that um, I think it's absolutely imperative that we start having a larger public conversation around not only what is managed retreat, mm -hmm. but and where are people leaving behind, but where are they gonna go? I think the place that we help people move to and thinking about the dynamics of that move is as important as thinking about the places that they're leaving behind. So I do think that conversation is becoming more robust, but I, I'm not sure that I see it exactly in relationship to Ida. Sure. Well, and you referred to some of the things that have frustrated you about the conversation around climate change. I mean, what, and you just mentioned some of the, the content that you would like to see more of, the, the, where, the where do people go, for example. Is there anything about the 
format of that conversation that you would like to see change as well? I mean, you and I have talked a little bit um, in front of other people at this point about, um, you know, you, you put to front and center the voices of some of the people that you talk to in researching this book. Um, what else do you see a need for in terms of how this, this subject is approached and who gets spoken to and how it's arranged? Yeah, I feel like, you know, I guess one thing that I perhaps started to allude to with my previous answer in response to sort of media coverage of Hurricane Ida is I do think that we have almost a knee jerk uh, response now to the language that is typically used to describe climate change as record breaking. I think that we have become sort of immune to that. And so in order to break through some of the numbness that I think comes with encountering each of these sort of unprecedented events as being spoken about in much the same terms. I think one of the ways that you get around that is by moving out of the sort of eyewitness expert perspective that can wield that kind of language and mm -hmm situating oneself much closer to the ground in the communities that are bearing the brunt of the burden of these events. I certainly felt like the thing that changed me the most while working on this book was not listening to experts talk about, you know, six feet of rise by the end of the century or seven or eight or nine. It was sitting in Chris's living room and hearing him talk about the ways in which climate change has slowly broken apart the community that defined him and the ways in which the members of that community maintain contact and conversation and solidarity with one another despite mm -hmm. this threat. Um, because I think there's actually really a series of really important lessons to be learned around how a single person becomes part of a we, becomes part mm -hmm. of um, a collective that can advocate for real change. Um, I think that we see climate change as producing really interesting solidarities amongst frontline communities, amongst neighbors who might not otherwise have a reason to like fight for something together. And mm -hmm. I think that those are the stories that we still aren't hearing enough about. And those are actually the stories that have a lot to teach us about things that we need to learn to get better at um, in, the, in the years and decades and centuries ahead. I think it's really imperative that we start to think of ourselves as, as a we, as opposed to a singular eyes. And so, resituating that conversation on the ground in communities that are already addressing that transformation, I think would be um, beneficial to all. Uh, we have an anonymous question that I wanna read for them. And it is just, what was one of the most difficult interviews you've conducted in preparation for putting out this book? Oh. Two jump to mind, um, but probably the one that most immediately comes to mind is one that appears in the book. Um, it is a conversation that I had with a woman named Nicole Montalto who lost her father during Hurricane Sandy. And I had been, you know, spending time in researching the community where Nicole grew up and where her father passed away for over a year before she shared that story with me. Mm -hmm. I had actually been invited to a celebration of life um, party to celebrate her father. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived, she grabbed me by the arm and she was like, you're writing a book so you're gonna help me memorialize your, my father and I will tell you what happened on the night of Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, it was just devastating to sit with this woman in this place of great grief. She lost her father when she was in her early twenties. And that, I think that event really sent many members of her community on that quest to sort of start to petition the state to ask for funds to relocate. I would say that was hard, but even harder was, you know, I transcribed the interview. I didn't know what to do with it for a really long time. Eventually I decided to um, edit out about 95% of what she said till I had this really clean narrative arc of the story of the search for her father and discovering him dead in their basement. Mm -hmm. um, and what was even harder than the interview was then sending her that edited transcription and saying, you know, I want your story to be part of this book, but if you don't want it to be part of this book, then I will take it out. And if you want anything changed, let's have a conversation around what you want changed. And it really opened up a dialogue between Nicole and myself and we edited the piece together till, she, till it got to a point that she was happy with it. And that interaction like taught me how to write Rising. I didn't mm -hmm. really know anything about writing these testimonies that ground each chapter. I didn't yeah. know that that's what I was gonna do. Um, it, Nicole's story sort of demanded that interaction from me. And so mm -hmm. it was both really challenging, but also, I mean, a watershed moment. Speaking of that, because I think that really speaks to, you're coming at this, as you've said, as a poet. Um, and speaking of someone who's trained in journalism, like we're taught never to let our sources, quote unquote, like help write or edit the piece. Like that is, that is already breaking a cardinal law of journalism. So in some ways, the conversation you're talking about needing to happen requires some change from the very institutions that are tasked with telling that story. Totally. I mean, I think, you know, I celebrate this form of storytelling and yet I know it is, goes against every kind of journalistic convention that exists. Mm -hmm. And I think I've thought a lot about why I feel why I work this way. And I don't mean that everyone has to work this way, but like, why mm -hmm. do I work this way? And I think sometimes when we think of the role that a journalist plays, their job is to sort of inform public discourse mm -hmm. and they're responsible to that, that public. And I always felt like my first responsibility was to the speaker of the testimony, to my interviewees. And in part, I think that that also has to do with you know, when we think of a journalist and they're informing public discourse, part of what they're doing is sort of trying to perhaps make less opaque um, certain political processes or, or processes where the folks who are in their stories hold tremendous power. And so mm -hmm. they, in maybe exposing some of the misuses of that power trying to do like a broader public good mm -hmm. and the people in my stories tend to have a lot less power than I have um and so it never felt right to me to sort of extract their story and take it as my own. Instead, I sort of felt like I wanted to hand them a microphone. Like I wanted through this kind of writing process to help bolster agency as opposed to take away agency. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to, we have a probably time for a few more listener questions that I wanna make sure we get in. Uh, Rebecca from Denver, Colorado has a question back about relocation again. Rebecca, go ahead. Uh, you may be muted. There Hi. you go. I wanted oh. to check with you on what are the types of 3D documentation or ceremonies that you have heard or observed for leave taking that are assisting residents with the process of relocation? It's a hard process. What is helping these residents make this hard move? 
That's a really great question. And I wish that I had like the perfect answer to it. And I, I fear that I don't though. What I will say is that for instance, like if we look at Chris on the Island, he has become a sort of de facto historian of the Island and he gathers together, you know, his photographs and his family photo, like his family memorabilia, but he's also started to do um, his own historical investigation of, you know, when did oil extraction come to the island? What was the island like a hundred years ago? And these questions have sent him to local archives and in search of any kind of ephemera or things that exist around um, around the island. And he gathers those things together. Like whenever I go out and see him, he has like new articles from 1937 or 1954 that he's got a photocopy of. And nice. he has like, you know, boxes of photographs and he has his little three ring binders and he has his own organizational system. And he really serves as like the memory keeper for that community, which is relatively small at this point in terms of who still lives out there. And I think doing that work actually makes it easier for him to imagine moving somewhere else and keeping the memory of that place alive. Um, I certainly heard it sort of alluded to through this Penobscot historian, John Bear Mitchell, who I interviewed, but also my students have interviewed, who talks about the ways in which um, his tribe's ceremonies still honor the caribou, even though there are no caribou left in Maine, even though you know the last caribou died over a hundred years ago. So you still see that animal um, spoken of with reverence and uh, it's not like they get wiped out of the ceremonial language of this, of these, of this tribe. They're still very much alive, and there's a recognition that they're not around in in a physical sense any longer. Um, I will also say that in places that I've seen move, if you know, through relocation, there's often still folks who go out and visit on the weekends or who you know it's not like the place that they leave behind disappears entirely. There's still ways to access it, even if that's by boat or even if that's um, not as like a permanent dwelling place. I think, I think sometimes we think of managed retreat as having these really stark outcomes that it's gonna shatter a community that you're never gonna get that place back. And I think it's a lot more, um, I think the lines are a lot more blurry and the community mm -hmm. can become closer knit because they actually fight for something together, even though, you know, so-and-so might not be your neighbor anymore, uh, at least not next door neighbor anymore. So mm -hmm. I don't have an easy answer to that question, but it's a really great question to be asking. Yeah, we have another question um, also about retreat in some ways, but uh, we did a Zoom with a couple of marsh ecologists. And one of the things we talked about a lot was the migration of marshes and how not allowing marshes to migrate also makes it hard for them to survive. Um, and no one's really going around tearing up highways or golf courses at this point to allow marshes to migrate. Um, but Anita, well, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a beautiful vision, but it doesn't sound like anyone's close to making it happen. Um, but Anita from Brooklyn has a question about maybe one way that might might sort of we might preserve marshes and sort of allow for people to stay where they want to. Anita, do you want to unpack that a bit for me? I don't know that I no, that's quite great. summarize that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I was thinking about after reading your book, and it, I appreciated the writing and the um, storytelling, particularly. Um, but I'm familiar with public trusts and I wondered if that's a concept that's been circulating among the groups that are most impacted by um, rising sea levels and whether or not 
um, you know, state governments, city governments are contemplating buying out more people and maybe creating public space. I don't know. It sounds like there's some squishiness, which is a term I think that, that Christy used earlier. But um, yeah, if that's being talked about and considered. That's a great question. Um, and it actually makes me think of one thing that I read very recently, which was about managed retreat after Ida, now that you mentioned it, Christy, um, which was looking at um, a community in Philadelphia or in and around Philadelphia. I'm not familiar with it, but mm -hmm. there is a conversation around getting this low lying community to relocate um, together as a group in new state built housing nearby and then having the low low lying land where they live that has flooded regularly over the past decade if not longer um turned into a public trust and to become parkland that's very much in the like let's talk about this not in the let's do this right now stages but mm -hmm. it is literally one of the complicated afterlives of climate change adaptation in general, like we have these ideas and they solve problems in an immediate sense, but then they lead to other problems down the line. And those problems look, you know, different depending on where you are. For instance, in Staten Island, you do have managed retreat happening. 600 homes were purchased and demolished. And the state is the caretaker of that land, but only until I think 2022. And they've actually been trying to hand it off to the city to become part of the parks department. Um, and the parks department doesn't want to take it over. It's complicated land to manage. Um, so this that's sort of one way of thinking about it. I think if you also look to Norfolk, Virginia, they're doing something really interesting right now where you know they have limited land that's going to be tenable for long-term use. Mm -hmm. um, Norfolk has a lot of low-lying flood-prone land. And so what they're doing right now is they're saying, oh, if you want to develop on some of the high land that we have here in Norfolk, you have to earn resiliency credits. And one of the easiest ways to do that is by extinguishing land use rights in the low lying flood prone parts of town. Mm. You extinguish land use rights by buying the owners of those properties out and helping them move. And the additional idea behind this um, kind of incentivized development program in Norfolk is that once those land use rights are extinguished and um, the city says they're probably going to try to take over management of that land, they'll try to earn something called, um, they'll try to lower the cost of flood insurance in mm -hmm. the region through a mechanism of the national flood insurance program called the community okay. rating system. It's complicated. Yeah. But the community rating. <laughs> the moment system, you say flood insurance, it's like, ah, oh. <laughs> um, the community rating system essentially gives a reduction on the cost of flood insurance in low lying communities. If they have other kinds of resiliency measures in place. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that land as wetland or open space, it will help the city earn points through that system to lower the cost of flood insurance throughout, throughout the county. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to maybe turn that land into a public trust of some sort and to manage it that way. So it's, you know, you ask this question and it actually, forks in like a million ways and becomes somewhat complicated somewhat quickly but yes there is talk of of turning these places into public trust or into city parks or into green space or blue space depending on who you're talking to mm -hmm. the challenge is you know even that costs money so then how do you make it cost effective and maybe one of the ways that you can talk about doing that is to make an argument that it can help you lower 
the burden of flood insurance in adjacent parcels or nearby parcels mm-hmm. by earning commu- community through the community rating system, <laughs> lowering the amount that your county is supposed to pay. Sounds like carbon uh, tax credits in some ways. Um, we are running near to the end and I want to give Carrie from Medford a chance to ask, she's our last listener question, but I'm going to follow up with one after that. And Carrie, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Elizabeth. Carrie Hewitt from um, Boston and the Climate Migration Network. Oh, um, hey, Carrie. We've been in touch, but hi. Oh. Um, I just wanted to, I loved um, rereading your book and I was really compelled by the idea of end sickness. And I'm wondering if you would just talk a little bit about it, such a physical way of describing anxiety over the changes that we're experiencing. And I just wondered if you'd share a story or or two that would that made you feel like you needed a name for what you were feeling. Oh gosh, so many moments of feeling end sickness. I feel like um, end sickness is this word that I use to describe how disorienting it feels like and really nauseating it is to bear witness to what feels like the end of one world um, or the end of many worlds and it I think it came about really for me sort of through two events that happened almost simultaneously. One is that my father developed a really debilitating kind of vertigo almost overnight where he completely lost his sense of balance and his sense of like what held him, tethered him in place upright on the planet was fundamentally disturbed. And he spent, and he still spends, he still has this vertigo. We don't really know what caused it. Um, you know, he's just constantly sort of low level nauseous and constantly sort of careening, um, because that, that internal balance mechanism has been fundamentally thrown off and watching him go through that felt like a actually really useful parallel for how it felt for me to be running in New England in November in a tank top and a pair of shorts because it's 80 degrees outside or I you know I remember a February where we had this like sudden 70 degree day 70 degree day and I grew Mm -hmm. up in this region I that never happened when I was a kid and so you simultaneously feel sort of like oh thank god it's not freezing cold out and then you're also Mm -hmm. like oh my God, this is actually a very small manifestation of this massive planetary change that's happening. And the fact that I feel it makes me sick. I've been feeling that a ton this fall in this really particular small way. My Twitter feed has had a lot of folks taking pictures of plants that are like still blooming in October. Mm -hmm. And I see that and I see the rugosa in my backyard blooming in October. And I'm like, that plant blooms in June. I know that. And the fact that it's blooming now is so fundamentally disturbing to me. And you kind of don't have anywhere, like, where do I put that energy? You just live alongside it. I think about how is my son going to think that rugosas bloom in June and October? Like that's just really fundamentally upsetting and nauseating. And so end sickness is like at least a word for me to try to hold some of that emotion, um, try to find language for this thing that human beings have never lived through before that we're causing. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for that question, Carrie. And personally speaking, I mean, Elizabeth, you've shared so much of yourself in this book. Um, I don't know if anyone who's in the New York area can relate, but when we had that flash flooding on September 1st, which was my birthday, and we were like bailing out the basement, which I live in, I live I live in a basement room in an apartment with multiple stories, so we were always safe, but just 
experiencing that and knowing that it was so much worse for people in other parts of the city were in relatively high ground. Um, I felt like I kind of understood that feeling in that moment, for example. Um, it was a really rough day. Um, I'm sorry. Last Christy. question. That's okay. I mean, it, like, you know, as you've said, like it, it, our vulnerability is all relative in some ways and everyone is vulnerable and realizing that can be scary, but also we have a lot to, I, my family personally has a lot to be lucky about too, or feel lucky about too. Um, so I'm going to end on a, on a forward looking question because one of the things that we have flailed about a bit is the, what do I do? the what next, what, what, you know, if part of the problem is that we're not recognizing that the most vulnerable going in are the most vulnerable coming out. And if we're not having conversations that center the people whose stories are actually happening, um, what can those of us here on the Zoom today do, advocate for, um, take this energy and put into that maybe makes a difference in the lives of the people who most need a difference made? I feel like um, similar to how I feel, similar to how I felt sort of going into this book where I thought like, okay, if you flood four times, flood five times, you're gonna wanna leave and it's a rational choice and everyone should respond the same way. I feel like a couple years ago, I used to think like, what should we do? And feel this imperative to be able to like answer that with like, well, these five things will lead to, um, you know, climate revolution. Mm -hmm. And I can't in good faith come up with those five things. I think the real way to go about um, addressing that question is sort of a, a two-step process. Like one, I think that there is actually a need to sit with the grief or the uncomfortableness or the end sickness and and like create space for yourself to be in that sensation of discomfort because I actually think spending time there leads to the next step which is taking action and I I think taking action means finding something that you care about deeply that's related to the climate crisis and finding other people who share that concern and working with them towards um, whatever goal that you set for yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, that has meant trying out a couple different things and trying to figure out which one fits. You know, I've gotten involved with the fight for affordable um, green energy in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I've started leading workshops, writing workshops for frontline flood survivors. I've started donating a portion of my, my speaking fees to this Anthropocene Alliance. And each of those is like a different attempt at becoming more active in addition to the fact that I like don't, you know, devote my professional life to writing about climate change. But there's some part of me that actually even gets frustrated sometimes with what writing can do and the limits of what it can accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so I think finding ways to work with other people. Um, another thing that I've, I've experimented with and that I actually find really rewarding is like working with scientists who are gathering climate data to just do some of the labor that mm -hmm is needed to be the extra hands on deck to get some of this stuff done. And I can promise you that like, if that sounds interesting to you and you have the gumption to reach out to your local like geology department, um, mm -hmm. there is a need, they need your <laughs> yeah. help. <laughs> um, there's always labor to be done. So, you know, mm -hmm. also a plug for the Anthropocene Alliance. They are the largest nationwide network of frontline flood and often wildfire survivors. Mm -hmm. And they have over 50 different community organizations all around the country. So if you're really hoping to get involved in stuff related to um, flooding and often wildfires, and especially in low income communities of color, the Anthropocene Alliance is a great, great organization to partner with. And for sure, there's most likely something within a stone's throw of your home. So I'll say like, Find what you care about, 
reach out to other people who share your concern. There's probably a group, potentially already a group in place and partner with them to try to make, to make the changes that you want to see happen at a scale where you can feel the change. Um, that's important too, I think, to see some results as opposed to being like, oh, am I gonna stop climate change? None of us singularly is gonna stop climate change, but we can work with other people to make an impact on the places and things that matter the most to us. So that's what I would say. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. My pleasure, thanks for having me. It's been, it's an honor to have this book as part of Science Friday's um, fall, fall book club. And thanks so much to the folks who turned in today and your great questions, I really appreciate them. We had so many good questions in there, some I didn't even get to, um, which thank you all for, for sending in such good questions. Per usual, if we got to everyone, uh, poor Elizabeth would be here till dawn and I, she has actual work and jobs to, going on as well. Um, so thank you all for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth, author of Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore and professor of the practice in the English department of Brown University. 